Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Brian Broom, and last week we wrapped up our series on the Prince of Egypt, and this week we are talking more about ancient Egypt, but more, more kind of using that as a springboard to talk about hermeneutics. But we'll get there in a minute, because every once in a while we like to do a little icebreaker, a little intro so that you can get to know us better, so that we can get to know each other better. So I have asked each of my co-hosts here to supply for me either the first line of a favorite book or a favorite first line of a book. And the other two of us will have to guess what book it belongs to. So Greg, would you like to go first? Sure, but in typical fashion for this podcast, I'm breaking the rule and I have two. <laughs> Two of which, or is it one of each? Two. It's well. It's they're both. One was my favorite book, but maybe isn't anymore. The other comes close to being my favorite book, and I read it for the first time just a couple days ago. Oh wow! So this this one, I'm guessing you'll recognize. Matrimony was ordained thirdly, said Jane Studdick to herself, mm. for the mutual society help and comfort that one ought to have of the other. Do we recognize that? Yes. yes. <laughs> that is a favorite. All right, Emily, who who, and what is that? That is C.S. Lewis's That Hideous Strength. Uh, I taught through it for the umpteenth time this, uh, <laughs> this last school year. And this time the class was not very receptive. And I thought some of their um, objections and criticisms were valid. It's, that sometimes is... Um, Turns, turns the people into caricatures rather than fully mm. fleshed out people. And that there's it's hard to sympathize with just about anybody. And I've always had my own criticisms of how he ends it up. I think he sets him up, sets himself up for failure um, by dismissing the church and mm. um, its ministry. Mm. I mean, what the, it's reduced to one thing. Merlin says, what about the church? And he simply says, it's scattered. There's no help there. I think Jesus mm. has a different opinion of his church than that. Yeah. Um, I think, and I think Lewis could have got around it by saying, well, "Right now, we're the part of the church that's on duty." Right? Yeah, I was going <laughs> to say, there's definitely an active community of believers here. Yeah, but that said, there are so many good lines and and relevant themes for right now. It is, in a sense, uh, pseudo dystopian. It shows mm -hmm. us a political, economic, scientific organization pushing for world control. Uh, using sociology and uh, the natural sciences, uh, and the the world they want to hand us is very dystopian indeed. Over against that is set Professor Ransom and his household of nice people, not all of whom are Christians. Right. And we get to it's it really is a tale of two cities mm -hmm. uh, or two companies. The company of Saint Anne's, most of whom are Christians and who treat each other well and believe in honesty and and love and compassion and value of God's world. And then the other side who pretend to care about things, but lie to each other, stab each other in the back and are out to destroy the planet. So there's, there are many themes and ideas here that are relevant. All right. The second book, let's see if you know this one. I didn't, I never would have got it. I, I've, I've always put it off for a very particular reason, which I'll tell you in a second. See if you know this one. When he was nearly 13, my brother Jem got his arm badly broken at the elbow. Anyone know that? When he so was what was near the brother's name? Jem. J E M. Jem. Oh, oh, yes, I know what this is. Don't I? Possibly. It's very. It's popular. something you hadn't read before, right? I'd never read it before. I think you once told me that you had no interest in reading this book. Yeah. Yeah. I was mistaken. I, I enjoyed <laughs> it. I enjoyed it thoroughly. Making my wife and girls kept saying, "No, no, no." We understand your objection, but that's minor. Uh, and they were right. It was it was a very wonderful book for a number of reasons. Brian, do you recognize it at all? No, I do not. It's one that we haven't started using at school until um, I think this last year my wife used it in American mm. Lit. So what is it, Emily? To Kill a Mockingbird. It's to, kill a really... mocking, to Kill oh, a Mockingbird. To Kill a Mockingbird. I have uh, not read it. Neither but have I'm glad I. To hear all right. I will um I will go lightly on it then. Uh, the, all I knew about it is involved some kind of trial and that racism was involved in this. Because of my own background and lineage, 
I don't like racism to the point that I run screaming from the room if I'm allowed to more, more often. I just kind of sulk off and don't go near those people anymore if I can help it. And so it's not a, a, talking about it. It's not something I, I like except to denounce it. Uh, but my, my wife and girls kept saying, no, that's just that's a minor element here and it's handled well. And yes, she will get angry when it shows up. But there's a lot of other stuff going on. So I read it. I was very quickly drawn into it. I, I uh, enjoy the style very much. It is a slice of Southern Americana in the 30s, and which is just close enough to my own childhood that, you know, things that were active and invented or being used or sold, marketed in the, in the 30s often endured into the late 50s and early 60s. Like, oh, I know that product. Oh, I know that toy. Oh, I, yeah. So it was, it was part of my life. Um, but there's also a great many relevant comments about the educational system, hmm. about Christianity, that I think are, I think all that she says is completely fair. Uh, she writes as one who lived in a small Southern town and saw the good and the bad. And she's, she's equally generous with the good and the bad. Here, here's what, Here's the hypocrisy and moralisms of some Christians. Here's the generosity and honesty of others. But it's never too heavily handed. And I think in the end, she ties it up predictably because she's written herself to the point of this is only going to work if this happens. Yep, that happened. But that's what you want. I mean, Frodo <laughs> has to get the, the ring in the, in the volcano somehow. What? He didn't? That's a dumb story. Anyway, so that's mine. <laughs> To Kill a Mockingbird by Hopper and Lee and C.S. Lewis is that hideous strength. Brian, you got one. Yeah. Or Please I have do. two because I also have two. And I would feel bad if you were the only one who didn't have two. <laughs> so I do have two. Excellent. Uh, <laughs> before I remember the, the one that I was just talking to you about before we started mm -hmm. recording, I was looking at a different one. And now I have both uh, just on, on, in front of me on my desk. So I'm going to start with the first one, wherein uh, the answer to what it is is given in the first sentence. It's oh. the way of things. <laughs> Doesn't matter. It's a great line and a great book. Here, my dear Marcellinus, is the fulfillment of my promise, a book in which I have taken upon myself the task of defending the glorious city oh. of God against those oh. <laughs> who prefer their own gods to the founder of that city. My boy, Augustine. <laughs> City of God. City of God by St. Augustine, which I've been, I made very good progress two weeks ago and um, <laughs> have not made progress since. I think I'm in the middle of book four or five at the moment. I think book five. Anyway, it's been a fantastic read. Uh, if you listen back to this podcast, you will hear me reference it multiple times because for some reason it keeps being very relevant to what we're discussing. I, I wonder, yeah, <laughs> you know, in the um, in in my comments or intro to the, the unpublished book that's sort of the, our uh, map for this this podcast, I explicitly compare what we're talking about to the city of God, <laughs> except in a very humble way of saying, and we're not Augustine, <laughs> and this isn't the city of God, but. We're going to pursue some of the same things. Halting towards Zion, city of God. Uh, yeah. yeah, there it is. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> cool. And so um, don't hesitate to reference uh, Augustine or Augustine, as I said, as we talk today about the necessity of timelines, because a lot of mm. what Augustine was doing was starting history at the beginning and tracking it a bit by a bit through the cross into his own present, mm -hmm. something that pagan history, well, there were not very many pagan historians to speak of, but the few there were didn't do that. Yeah. Um, and so we're going to, we are going to be talking about timelines and such. Emily. Speaking, wait, no, oh, Brian has one. another one. Oh, you got another one. Sorry. 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 Yeah. But also speaking of, of the timelines thing, what I find great is that he'll like spend an, an entire book just going through the pagans own history and showing them how you're, you're complaining about this in Christianity and you've forgotten these three dozen things and like he'll give <laughs> a little subheading for each of those three dozen things and yes. tell them why they're wrong. It's great. Um, I submit that future editions of city of God should have the subtitle dabbing on the pagans, um, <laughs> but I digress. So my second one, um, it, it, it's slightly related actually, I guess oh, in, yeah. in a way. And I'm actually going to cheat in a different way because I'm going to read the first two sentences. Oh, ah. okay. January 10, 
the 705th year since the foundation of Rome, the 49th before the birth of Christ. The sun had long set behind the Apennine Mountains. Lined up in full marching order, soldiers from the 13th Legion stood massed in the dark. Any guesses? That's great, and I have no idea. Yeah, same. <laughs> I mean, I know where I know when we are. I know where we are. I'm not recognizing the. I assume it's not an ancient book because the the, the language the seems modern. Yeah, the style mm -hmm. is very. Uh, yeah. But no, I don't recognize it. So there's there's not really any reason why you would know it unless you were talking with me about it two years ago because I was <laughs> fanboying over it very hard. But this is a book called Rubicon by the mm. English historian Tom Holland, oh, uh, which heard good I heard things about. about Tom, Holland. Tom Holland is a very interesting figure. He is a professed agnostic, but he is one of those agnostics who is very, very cognizant of how Christianity is the thing that has made Western civilization mm. as prosperous and free as it is. Didn't and he so, also play Spider-Man in the yeah, new? Yeah, I was wondering about that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a different Tom Holland, though they are both oh, English. Okay. But this is a I, I learned about this book also from a another fantastic podcast called Hardcore History with Tom, mm -hmm. with um, Dan Carlin, which everyone oh, should yeah. listen to at least once. And I like reading Rubicon. It became immediately apparent just from those first couple of sentences for instance <laughs> why dan carlin liked it so much yeah. um so if you already know dan carlin then you're going to probably love rubicon as well and i also recommend uh dan carlin's hardcore history so okay awesome all right my first offering for this game is the first line of a favorite book of mine and i can quote it from memory it goes <laughs> There was no possibility of taking a walk that day. I I just have an outside guess that it's sense and sensibility. It is not sense and sensibility. <laughs> and uh, I would read you the second line to try and help you out, but I lent it to a friend, so I don't have it. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea what the uh, second line is. It, it, it sounds too late for Jane Austen or any of the early... Um, Regents here, Victorian authors, I would guess late 18 to early or mid 1900s, but beyond that, nope, don't know. It is there Victorian. Was no there was no chance of, let's say There it again. was no possibility of taking a walk that day. <sighs> but it's so brief for Victorian. I, I did mention know. this a few weeks ago as my favorite book, so I thought it was going to be easy. Yeah, you were uh, presuming that we remembered. Every <laughs> um, dang and i i had a feeling you were going to do this one too <laughs> and i was like i should try and remember what that one is that she mentioned and i didn't remember it right. okay it is charlotte bronte's jane eyre ah, you yes. know um i'm glad my wife is not currently in the room because she'd be very angry at me or displeased <laughs> because uh-oh she's right there <laughs> i didn't recognize the first line of jane eyre Yes, I know you would have. I, uh, Brian and I both failed. Is that Emily's favorite? That's Emily, yes. Yeah. High quality girl there. Hi, she's a high quality girl there. All right, so, All right. yes. And my favorite first line of a book, that was the first line of my favorite book. My favorite first line of a book, I'm actually going to give you in Latin because in English it's too easy. <laughs> Please don't laugh at my pronunciation. I learned Latin in choir, not in Latin class. <laughs> so... In foramine terre habitabat habitus. Nec fadum in a whole, in a whole hood, Yeah, we, we got it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I feel terrible. I can't remember if that's actually the opening to The Hobbit or to Fellowship of the Ring. That's Hobbit. That's I knew, Hobbit. I, okay. Yeah, so Hobbit. I, I would have known that anyway. However, I just looked at the opening line of Lord of the Rings thinking I might use that, and it's a really bad opening line. <laughs> Thanks, oh, Tolkien. <laughs> okay, was that, right. that? That's two. Okay. That's two. So now we can uh, get into our actual topic for today. Nice. Which is the ancient Egyptian problem of chronology. There have been apparently a lot of changes in how we look at the Egyptian timeline over the past several hundred years as we start to try and 
piece together history. Um, that is, if you're not looking at the Bible. Um, once you open up the Bible, it's pretty clear about how things go. But I guess there's been a lot of dispute and progression over the Egyptian timeline. Well, remember that Egyptology uh, began with the translation of the Rosetta Stone. Unlike all other ancient cultures, Egypt was never lost. It just stood there in the desert with sand blowing past it. But there were all these hieroglyphs that no one could read until Champollion came along and using the Rosetta Stone was able to decipher it so we could begin to figure things out. And that followed shortly by um, the discovery, rediscovery of Troy by uh, Heinrich Schliemann, began this whole idea of digging in the ground and finding civilizations that were buried. And we're talking late 18, early 1900s. So we, we, we kind of think, well, everybody's always known about all this ancient stuff. No, to the point that in the late 1800s, higher critics, as they charged the Bible with many, many errors, one of them was that the Bible created the Assyrian Empire and the city of Nineveh out of nothing. That there were no records, no evidence, there was nothing out there but desert. So the Bible was flat out wrong. It just made up this whole Assyrian thing <laughs> until uh, Henry David Laird, Henry David, Henry something Laird, actually discovered the, the, the ruins of the city. Uh, and in that time, we have the sudden burst of activity. Well, historians once upon a time realized, and I, I would hope they still do, that if you're going to tell a story of history, you need dates to peg things through. You have, need to know what happened first, what happened second, what happened third. And there was one obvious place they could go for such a timeline that, as Emily said, that would be the Bible which begins with God counting off the days of the first week and then takes us through genealogies and time summaries and regnal data up at least to the time of Daniel and the Babylonian, actually the, the Persian Empire, and possibly even further, depending on what you do with some of Daniel's prophecies. So it was there. It was pretty clear. And, and although biblical scholars have differed over details, the, the structure was plain enough. You could quibble over, you know, plus or minus 100 years, depending on how you took a, a particular verse. But the the archaeologists and historians ignored that. And instead, they said, well, Egypt is so cool and great. Let's use it as our measuring rod, which would be great if they left us a chronology. <laughs> but they didn't because they're pagans. They're unconcerned with the flow of history because history is a created thing. And to be caught up in history is to be a creature. Mm. Uh, the whole idea of, of Egyptian culture, like all of pagan cultures, is to transcend history, time, and creation. So there was no interest in that. Furthermore, they were not above lying about mm. how long they held this or that people in, in captivity or how well they did in a particular year or who they lost to and who they didn't lose to. Mm -hmm. uh, we have, for instance, just a random thing. We have a record of um, the Assyrian king Sennacherib boasting that he shut up Hezekiah in Jerusalem like a bird in a cage. There's no word <laughs> from Assyria about what happened after that. Mm -hmm. The whole angel of death thing just didn't make it into their records. So, you know, there's things they, they don't tell us. But as, so historians and archaeologists wanted this, this, this measuring rod. And so they went to um, a scholar named Manitho, and I always forget the dates here, so hopefully I wrote them where I can find them. The uh, first list of Egyptian dynasties was compiled by the Egyptian priest Manitho, who lived about 300 BC. So notice what we have. This is not a chronology. This is a list of the dynasties in succession. Except we're not exactly told by Manitho that they're dynasties in succession. And worse than that, we're not exactly told anything by Manitho because we don't have his original book. What we have is him quoted by later authors mm. who don't agree on what he said exactly. <laughs> and the, the historians and archaeologists of the, of the early 20th century said, and that's going to be our timeline for measuring out the history of Egypt. And because Egypt is so cool and kind of what we know the, the most and the center of everything, let's tie every other nation's timeline to that. Now, Christians can see the problem here by simply laying out the chronology of Egypt as it was originally conceived of and seeing that it reaches back to about 5000 BC. 
which means it crosses the flood and creation. Eventually, Egyptologists got a clue that something was wrong here, and they began to look for ways of shortening it up. And the most obvious thing was, well, maybe not all of these dynasties reign in succession. I mean, we know that Menes unified Egypt at a particular time. Does that mean it stayed unified? Couldn't there have been dynastic wars and divisions? Well, yes, and, and generally most at this point, I think most Egyptologists would recognize this. But still, even after all the shuffling around, the founding of Egypt was still put on the other side of the flood. And it's Christians who want to believe what the Bible says about time and dates and such. We have to say, oh, well, that's not right. Egypt have to be, had to be born after the Tower of Babel. And in fact, uh, as we read through Genesis uh, 10 and 11, we're given an idea of exact of misery of Egypt mm -hmm. descended from Ham, one of Noah's sons. So we, we the Bible puts in a particular place, particular time after the flood. But the thing that's, that's um, otherwise difficult for historians who don't want to listen to the Bible is something the Bible says. This is um, 1 Kings chapter 6. Verse 1, it came to pass in the 480th year after the children of Israel were come out of the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month Ziph, which is the second month that he began to build the house of the Lord. Well, most historians, for good or bad, are pretty well agreed on when Solomon reigned. It's about a thousand years before Christ, give or take. And the Bible here says very clearly the Exodus was 490 years earlier tracking it down even to the very day, it's that exact. Mm -hmm. And so we can do that. We can go back to Solomon's reign, count back the 490 years, and we come to dynasties that are fairly familiar to anybody who's read a world history book. Uh, Hatshepsut, the first female pharaoh who wore a beard in public. <laughs> What's his name? Thutmose of the third, who uh, expanded Egyptians' uh, military power into uh, Canaan in the Middle East, and the boy king we know as Tut. Uh, these, are, these are fairly well-known monarchs, and they ruled in succession. We have enough information. We're pretty sure they ruled it. They reigned in succession. We know the relationships, the families, and such. And nothing major happened during their reigns that would or could be the Exodus. Now, remember again what the Bible tells us about the Exodus. By the time God was done, he had destroyed all their crops, all their cattle, removed all of their treasures of silver, gold, and jewels, removed their slave labor, destroyed their army and their chariots, destroyed at least one male in every household, the firstborn, destroyed the heir to the throne, and destroyed their pharaoh, who, contrary to Hollywood, did die in crossing the Red Sea. And that's just, on top of that, you can have the demoralization, the philosophical and religious defeat of the gods. There was nothing left there. And yet we look at what the Bible says, and we look at these kings and queens that we know about. This doesn't fit. This can't go here. So either the Bible's wrong or the Egyptian chronology is wrong. I, w I was walking through... Um, a facility we now use for the school when it was first there, and I found a random Bible just thrown down someplace. I picked it up and flipped through it. It's called the Life Application Study Bible. It's published in 2004, and it says, no evidence of this great exodus has been discovered in Egyptian historical records. And I believe what it says next amounts to, but since this doesn't affect anything having to do with our salvation, dot, dot, dot. Mm. It doesn't affect our salvation, whether God can tell us what <laughs> happened truthfully or not. Well, and then see, that's that's the question. Does infallibility and inerrancy, do they apply to the timeline, to chronology? Now, we, I assume, it's been so long, I don't remember, but I assume we probably talk about this some when we talked about creation, mm -hmm. because that's usually where you run into it. Does God, God counts off six days and then one more, seven. Can God tell time or not? Is it important that he tell time? When God says so and so many days or so and so many years, is that um, spiritual metaphor? Or can we trust him to tell us the truth? Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 says, and I declare to you the gospel, how that 
uh, Jesus Christ died for us, since according to the scriptures, he was buried. He rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Part of the gospel is that Jesus rose the third day. Not the fourth day, not the second day. Not and rose some... historically and physically yes. in his body. In his body. <laughs> yeah. um, so if, if we're willing to dismiss the Bible's other chronology, why are we suddenly willing to embrace it here? Or are we? Are we willing to say, well, yeah, Paul puts in third day because, you know, it was part of the formula of the time, but he doesn't really mean it had to be the third day. It was third dayness or third day like, or some panel of redemptive uh, biblical theology called third day. But it wasn't like there was actually a calendar or a clock involved here. Does God work in terms of calendars and clocks? That is to say, does he interact with us where we are? He's not immersed in time, but we are. Mm -hmm. Does he really speak into our existence? Does he understand it? Is he aware of it? Does he, can he communicate in terms of it? Or is all of his discussion of time, what Francis Schaeffer used to call some kind of upper story experience, mm -hmm. where the language has connotations that sound, ooh, that sounds religious, third day, ooh, but doesn't really mean anything. Well, of course, God is beyond time and beyond human language, right? So anything that we use to describe him is compromising his holy otherness. Yes, good Barthianism there. <laughs> because, you know, that's, that's ultimately what we're dealing with. This is neo-orthodoxy. When I teach the varying interpretations of Genesis 1 in, in systematics, that's always the hard one to explain to young kids, freshman students particularly. What 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 is this, this uh, Barthianism or this... Um, what do they call it? Crisis theology, New Orthodoxy. Uh, and, and they learn a form and they recite it and they write it down in their final. But I think it takes a while in reading and experience and practice interaction on a secular campus before you really understand what they're saying here. One of my favorite bumper stickers is God is too great to be contained in any one religion, which simply is to say, you cannot say anything about God that is true. Nor can they, nor can they, nor can they. It's all kind of true-ish if you look at it the right way and hold your mouth right. But don't try to bind God down to any of that because that would putting, be putting God in the box, as you say, would be denying his holy otherness. And yet what the Bible does from Genesis 1-1 is to come to us as a clear revelation of the heart and mind of God in propositional form where God created created all things in the beginning is the opposite of God did not create or God mm -hmm. did not create all things or God did not create all things in the beginning or, you know, you run through the possibilities. Uh, in other words, God is able. God God is not so great that he can't understand us. He's so great that he can. Mm -hmm. his, his infinite and eminence are the counterbalance to his transcendence. Not that there's anything, any kind of tension here. That's just who God is. We can... We can look at him and speak of his transcendence, or we can look and speak of his eminence, but it's the same mind of God. It's just, yes, yeah, so great we cannot understand. My thoughts are not your thoughts. He says in words to Israel. <laughs> they're both true at the same time, and they're true with regard to counting anything in particular, you know, like three persons, one God. They're also true when it comes to counting years. Months, days, hours. Just to read the the story of Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, which I did lately in John in my daily Bible reading, you keep running into third hour, sixth hour, you know, mm. all the because the timeline sixth, matters. Yes, yeah. yeah, it does. We're 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 telling a real story, and we're going to come back to this, I believe, next week. Let me just do a commercial for the next time. Because what happens if you don't have a timeline? Well, then you don't have sequenced events. And if you don't have sequenced events, you don't have a story. I've done this before. I'll do it again. Um, so there was the shepherd boy named David. He killed a giant. And then Noah took all of the animals into the ark two by two. And Peter tried to walk in the water and slip. For God so loved the world. And Jesus is coming back again. So the baby was born in Bethlehem of Judea. Uh, and God created the world in, in six days, and then Abraham tried to sacrifice his son. There you go. There's a story. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Does it, does, it, does it matter whether Frodo throws the ring in at the beginning or the end? 
whether uh, <laughs> whether Elizabeth first loves Darcy or first resents him. Does that affect anything in, in the rest of the story, do you think? <laughs> Although, as a uh, extreme quibble, I will say that technically Frodo did not throw the ring into the lava. <laughs> I'm just saying. Just saying. Yeah, he, he, he thought about it for a long time. <laughs> but see, even there, we're talking about a sequence of events. And if we don't have that sequence, we don't have a story. Now, again, anticipating next time, we can think of our own lives. I'm getting old enough now that my children keep worrying about me contracting dementia. Turns out my, my daughter, Emily, has um, tracked down my birth father, who is in a care facility for people with dementia. Mm -hmm. So that's, <laughs> that kind of stirred up concerns a little bit. What happens when you can't remember the story of your life? Was it I got married and then the first baby came, or the first baby came, then I got married. Do you think that affects the story of your life somehow? Or did I go to war and then I got married? Did I work first for Boeing or for NASA? Did I, go, did I, you know, you start going through these things, and if you can't sequence them, you don't know the story of your life and you don't know who you are. So we're going to be talking mm -hmm. next time about identity. But here we're talking about the identity of God's covenant people. And we're talking about that coherent story that is the Bible, that is redemptive history, real history. Mm -hmm. It just happens to focus upon God's plan of redemption. Well, I think we should point out that there are a lot of godly people who would disagree with us on this, who believe in an older earth or at least a stretched out timeline from the genealogies and such. Yeah. And we, we there's a difference between saying none of this is historical. It's all some kind of literary rearranging of concepts that has no connection to real history. And saying, I don't like the way you're interpreting connections between events A and B because I don't think that's how the numbers should be handled. A hermeneutical argument can simply be an exegetical argument. Let's mm -hmm. look and see what the Bible says about these numbers. And as long as we're willing to do that, that that's that's fair enough. And as I said earlier, uh, even when you, you look at the Bible's timeline, there are points where very godly men have disagreed, but they tend to be uh, disagreements that amount to a couple hundred years there or 20 years there or 50 years there. The genealogies or the um, chronologies, the regular data of the, the kings of Israel and Judah at one or two points is extremely difficult to follow. And then there's there's discussion about um, the 430 years that reach from uh, Abraham to Moses. Paul says it's 430 years from the promise to the giving of the law. But if you read what he seems to be quoting in Exodus, the sojourning of the, of the children of Israel who sojourned in Egypt was 430 years. That makes it sound like it's like their time in, in Egypt was 430 years. Well, those mm -hmm. aren't exactly rec reconcilable on that premise. And so that throws you back on comparing scripture with scripture. Mm -hmm. In some cases, looking at the original Greek or Hebrew and seeing what how the verses can be interpreted legitimately. This is all within the framework of ordinary uh, biblical scholarship. Mm -hmm. and, or and, and it reading a book. Reading you know? a book, yeah. There's <laughs> the possibility that maybe I didn't read it right. Um, uh, but what happens too often, and we're all guilty of this to some extent, mm -hmm. and part of growing older is learning to disassociate yourself from it, we bought into a lot that we were told by our favorite books, by our favorite pastors, by our favorite teachers. This is true of um, pastors and theologians. And um, sometimes those people that we admire so much were wrong about this or that. Sometimes they were wrong about a lot. But sometimes it was just one or two minor things, and we tend to be very loyal, or we never it never occurs to us to question them, sometimes because we have more important things to worry about. Mm -hmm. And as, as we grow older, we, we tend to find a little more time to say, wait, remember my pastor saying this, what, what exactly is the evidence? And if we have time, if we care enough, we go back and check it out. And yet sometimes we don't have time. Again, that's another thing that we can honestly reckon with. And, and, and we always should. Anytime, anytime you're going to debate someone on a theological issue, you're not, only, you're not simply talking about scripture. You're talking about everybody, your debating partner, knows, trusts, loves, who believes what he does. Because mm -hmm. if he admits he's wrong, 
it's not only it's not just that he's wrong his pastor's wrong his parents are wrong the church he grew up in is wrong his favorite authors who built so much into his life are wrong that's hard mm -hmm. and that's human yeah and and we need to have great patience and humility with that mm -hmm. Uh, and there, there's a time to to push for it. No, you're you're going to be a teacher. You need to deal with this. And time to say, yeah, how about those Dodgers? Um, mm -hmm. You know, let let it go. Not not every argument needs to be to the death. Mm -hmm. But then perhaps finally there is the danger of a late Gnosticism in Protestant Christianity that emphasizes the heart, the mind, the spirit the emotions, religious sentiment, and downplays the body, economics, politics, law, and geography, and clocks, and things like that. And sometimes that sneaks up on us, and we don't realize it. But sometimes we do realize it, and we just say, well, yeah, that's not all that important. I mean, and, and that favorite fallback that this, this life application Bible used. But does it really affect any doctrine pertaining to salvation? And you, you can understand why people would go there. Mm -hmm. I would hope we can also understand why that's not a good place to go. Right. Because we're focusing upon the saving of souls as the most important thing the Bible has to give us. And I think we have to insist that it's not. The glory of God, the integrity of the Trinity, the goodness of God, that's the most important thing. If God is not truth in a way that we understand and can talk about truth, then we're, we're going to lose everything, including the salvation of souls. Mm -hmm. If Jesus didn't r rise again on the third day, we're all lost. And and we ha and, and the, the things that can creep up and try to smother that can begin way, way back in time. In fact, at the beginning of the world. How many of the things that we're fighting right now have to do with, with things uh, surrounding the, the creation, the relationship of men and women, the, the the relationship between a man and woman in marriage in particular. These are things that happened on the sixth day of creation. Or did they? Was it, as Jesus said, in the beginning? Or was it, you know, a few million years into the process when one of our ancestors became sentient enough for God to grant him the image of God? And then, you know, what are, what are we dealing with here? Mm-hmm. And so even when there are good intentions, we sometimes have to kind of gently slap the hand and say, yeah, no, you don't see where this is This is leading. Let me try to show you. Mm -hmm. But we should be ladies and gentlemen about it, certainly. Mm -hmm. And then there are the neo-Orthodox who just really don't believe the Bible. And that's, <laughs> there you draw the sword of the spirit and start slashing. <laughs> Sorry. There, there have been at least... Two scholars in, in recent, fairly recent years, recent with them compared to my lifetime, who've faced the Egyptian problem and have tried to come up with a solution. The first was Emmanuel Velikovsky. Now, just to say the name in most scientific circles is to get weird looks and, and boos and hoots because, frankly, Velikovsky was a little weird. <laughs> he had all kinds of ideas about the evolution of the solar system and how the planets got to be where they are and where Venus came from and how how all of this fit, fits into the miracles that happen in the Bible. He's just a little imaginative, shall we say. <laughs> Which again, we've said it before, when it comes to theology, imaginative <laughs> is not a compliment. No, it's not in theology, but sometimes in science it can be, can but be. only if it gets checked out thoroughly by, by the normal processes that scientists <laughs> ought to go through. But alongside of that... He wrote a book called um, Ages and Chaos, where he looks at the problem of this long chronology and invoking to some extent his weird ideas on um, cosmology and astrophysics, nonetheless makes a very simple suggestion, which uh, Egyptologists had already began to use some. What if the, di what if the dynasties overlap? Mm -hmm. What if they're not all in succession? And then he supplied his idea of how they could be shown to overlap in a way that would significantly reduce the timeline, bring it more into line with what the Bible says, although he was not an Orthodox Christian by any means, and um, begin to make sense out of, of the ancient world. It also eliminated some of the dark spots, dark ages in the Egyptian timeline. Well, he was ignored to death because he was just too weird. People didn't even want to think about him. Sometime later... When I was a young man, 1971, an Adventist scholar, uh, Dr. Donovan Curaville, 
produced a two-volume set called The Exodus Province. Uh, I, I don't remember if he makes any uh, reference to Velikovsky or not. Mostly he sets out doing the same sort of thing and, again, suggesting ways that these dynasties could be shown to either overlap or, in some case, cases, some are not actually dynasties. They're, they're a list of local rulers under a particular pharaoh. And, again, his, his, his overall work is to shorten um, the timeline of Egypt so that it fits in with what the Bible uh, tells us should be happening. And in the process, he does push and, and pull things so that 490 years before Solomon, 1445 BC, is no longer a high peak in Egyptian history. It now becomes uh, a period where something like the Exodus is possible. And in fact, he manages to come up with a, a manuscript that's fairly well known, but there was just confusion as to where it might fit and what it might be talking about. But if if Kerrville is right and it does fit there, well, this is these are some of the things it says. It's called the uh, Ipur Papyrus, or Admonitions of an Egyptian Sage. Plague is throughout the land. Blood is everywhere. Forsooth, the river is blood, yet men drink of it. Forsooth, gates, columns, and walls are consumed by fire. Forsooth, men are few. He who places his brother in the ground is everywhere. Forsooth, the desert is throughout the land. The gnomes are laid waste. A foreign tribe from abroad has come to Egypt. Forsooth, gold and lapis lazuli, silver and malachite, carnelian and bronze, stone of Yefet, are fastened on the necks of female slaves. Indeed, grain has perished on every side. People are stripped of clothes, spices, and oil. Everybody says there is none. It would be strange if the Exodus left no mark at all on Egyptian culture, history, and records. Now, this is only one thing, but it sure sounds an awful lot like the Exodus. Yeah. Specifically, and, the, the jewelry on slaves' necks. The, That's a exactly. little too specific. Yes, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. And uh, the river is blood, and yet people still drink from it. So, there, and, and, and uh, neither Velikovsky or Caraville have the last word on this. There's still a lot to do. But one of the main challenges has been getting people to, getting historians and Egyptologists to actually rethink their basic presuppositions. And as we all know, that's always a hard thing. Yeah. There are things that you take as your givens. You were taught them in kindergarten, whether it be archaeological kindergarten or <laughs> or whatever. You know, when you're for your first day of class, here's your timeline, people. Know it, work from it for the rest of your careers. And it's hard to go back and say, no, I've been wrong about everything. Not a little bit after that, but about 20 years later, Peter James and some other scholars, as far as I know, all of them secular scholars, they don't claim any kind of Christian testimony in their book, produced another book called Centuries of Darkness, uh, again, to challenge the chronology of ancient Egypt. Their focus is later on, uh, after um, Israel was well into the land, so they don't really talk about the, the Exodus and all that. But the conclusion they come to is that Egyptian chronology is 300 years too long, and uh, their solution, well... Let's try overlapping the dynasties. It will probably shrink it back to where it needs to be. Mm -hmm. So we've got our, our weird, wacky uh, cosmologist. We've got our Seventh-day Adventist, very staid, quiet scholar who didn't get much publicity. And now we've got a team of very competent secular scholars who could actually get published in the, main, in the mainstream. And, and they're all saying, guys, why don't we rethink this? There was there's one line in uh, Peter James' book where he says this: the dates the Old Testament gives, even those for the historical periods which are potentially useful to archaeology, have been altered, mangled, or rejected in arbitrary fashion. It seems that the Bible has suffered from this kind of hypercritical treatment simply because it is the Bible. A similar approach would never have been taken with the sacred literature of other ancient Near Eastern societies. Mm. It's the closest that book ever gets to any acknowledgement of Christianity, but they have the guts to say, you know, would we have treated any other significant manuscript evidence the way we've treated the Bible? No. Then why are we treating the Bible mm. that way? Could it be because it is the Bible? Mm. 
So um, we're back to to hermeneutics, to the the dangers of Gnosticism, the danger of pretending that God can't, won't, or doesn't count, that he won't communicate with us in numbers or in calendar history. And uh, we we need to keep on, if we're going to have any kind of, of long-term effect in history, in archaeology, in sociology, well, we have to keep insisting that what God says is what God intends to say, and it is understandable. Mm -hmm. And we're not allowed to brush it away because we're not comfortable with it, because our science hasn't got as far as the Bible already has. We need to insist that, that uh, inerrancy and infallibility apply to every word of God. Because if we don't, is, is, an, is an issue of salvation at stake here? And I, th I think, Emily, you said this at the beginning, or at least you said it when we, when we first started talking. Does it matter whether or not God can tell us the truth about anything? He can tell us, he can talk to us about the, the the mysteries of heaven, but he can't talk to us about earthly things. Didn't Jesus say something like that to Nicodemus? <laughs> if I have told you of earthly things and you believe not, how will you believe me if I tell you of heavenly things? And later on to the Pharisees, I don't accuse you. Well, there's another one that accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. For if you had believed his words, you would have believed me. We don't, we don't get to pick what we're going to believe. We have to believe the Bible as the Bible. Mm -hmm. Brian, you've been looking pensive. Do you have thoughts <laughs> that you'd like to share? I'm really just absorbing because this is not my area of expertise. So, mm -hmm. but I, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> well, this okay, is not that's... my area of expertise either. So, Greg, thank you for sharing some of your expertise with us. Well, you are welcome. Now, I'm going to throw something else at you again. Uh, previous of coming attractions. Remember that, uh, that well, see, beginning lines. I don't know if this is the first line, but it's one of the first lines of the book. See if you recognize it. No, it's not. It's, a, it's the beginning of a speech someplace, someplace in the first chapter. The introduction of our Ford's Model T, chosen as the opening date of a new era. <laughs> All crosses have their tops cut off and became T's. At the same time, all the museums were destroyed and all the mm -hmm. statues taken down. Sound familiar? Yep, yep. Okay, she's got it. Brian, you recognize it? This is, no. I could <laughs> not finish this book, to be frank. I have not yet finished is it, it. I read about Brave 50 New World? pages. It's yes. Brave New World. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, but notice the Model T becomes the place for starting a new dating system. Mm -hmm. And they destroyed the museums and the books and the records so they can rewrite history from the year zero. Mm -hmm. um, it's like the French Revolution. Like the French Revolution. Mm -hmm. So that's those are some of the things we're going to talk about. Why do you do that? Why do you erase your past? Why do you re restart the calendar? What are you really after? And what does it have to do with your own sense of identity, your community, the people that you have some kind of vital relationship with, and your freedoms? So we'll stop there and we'll pick it up next time. <laughs> All right. Well, there's probably something to do, at least with the uh, restarting the date. It's everyone wants to make their own new world order. They're forgetting yeah. that we we already established that with the birth of Christ. Like yep. that was yep. the start of the new age. <laughs> <laughs> Why do so That's many people point. hate the BC AD dating system? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Why is Think it a big deal? One. Yeah. Well, thanks guys so much for this conversation. I wish it could go on a lot longer. But thanks also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. And thank you to you, our listeners. Please send us an email if you'd like. Haltingtowardsion at gmail.com is our email address. You can also like our Facebook page or follow me and Brian on Twitter, I guess. I'm like two seconds from deleting my entire Twitter profile because I'm just so done. Twitter I'll just say, place. don't follow me on Twitter. I, I don't want to be Twitter famous. We're good. Okay. All right. Don't follow us on Twitter, but do like our Facebook page, Helping Towards Zion. Thanks so much for listening. We'll see you next week. Bye.